So we're back at it. Here's one of the things that makes the game uh, pretty interesting from my perspective. If you look uh, along the, the main, the primary uh, odds here, you can see we had a 10 to 1, and a 5 to 1, 5 to 1, 5 to 1, 4 to 1. And then you have uh, these intercepts or top cover to protect the air assets that you're bringing to provide ground support strikes uh, for the combat. And that involves two die rolls. And then you have uh, the, uh, if, if there's a, an attack that uh, breaks through and attacks the uh, ground attack uh, form air formation, there's another die roll. So that's two die rolls. And then you have uh, air defense, so you have the AA. Uh, that's a third die roll. And then you will uh, know how many odds tables, odds columns, you're going to be moving on the CRT based on the end result of those three die rolls for each side. So it's gonna be six die rolls. Now you may say, oh, six die rolls, that's a lot of die rolls. Well, it's not when you look at, when you break it down and look at what you're actually doing. You know, you're taking uh, two different air missions and resolving all the things that need to happen with all, with all of those activities that go on. So what does that do? What it does is adds enough, uh, I guess, randomness or chance to the exercise that, uh, you know, you could have an attack that's at five to one, all of a sudden become a one to one attack, uh, or a five to one attack stay as a five to one attack, or here where we had the kind of the combination of uh, a four to one attack that's going to go up to seven to one, but then be pulled back down by the warthogs uh, uh, being halved. They were going to subtract four off of the attack, but now they're only subtracting two off of the attack. So we'll bring it down to. That's going to be a, a plus one there, so that's going to make that a five to one attack. So overall, <coughs> the the handful of attacks that are going on here, other than this uh, ten to one exercise, and I don't know why I didn't provide air support for there. I think I need to revisit that. Did I? Yeah, I may have been a cry. I may have missed one. But anyway, let's just let's just that's cool. Uh, so we've got a ten to one attack. And then everything else is basically five to one. So that was a pretty interesting, oh, this one's one to one, right? Uh, so that's a pretty interesting exercise in of itself, just how the air and uh, anti-air and the odds all factor in. Now, one thing that we haven't really talked about when it comes to combat is what, what, are, what are the actual numbers on the units mean? And in most of my videos, I really assume that you kind of sort of know the game and I'm just playing the game and sharing bits and pieces with you but this has kind of turned itself into a self tutorial for me so help me make sure that I understand the game better so I may as well uh, explain what all is going on here so uh, 237 means that we have a combat factor of 2 a defense of 3 and an effectiveness or proficiency rating of 7 alright uh, that's 7 is going to be used to represent the the uh, combat worthiness of the unit over over time. These little stars that you see here, where as as damage is inflicted, we're going to accumulate stars on underneath the counter, and that's going to reduce this number. So once we get to seven or actually get uh, more than seven, that unit will be eliminated and it's out of the game and we're done for good. The Soviets and the NATO forces can recover uh, these disruptions, they're called, can recover them if they're out of a zone of control and don't do anything for a turn, they can recover one. And so you can build them all back up to full strength if you're NATO or full strength minus one if you're a Soviet unit. So uh, what else do the, 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 does the efficiency or proficiency rating do for you? Well, it's a key part of the combat resolution as well. And it's something that I've already factored in here, but basically you look at the difference between the ratings. Uh, first of all, you've got to average your rating. So if I had a six and a four and a two here, I would have to take those together and average them and then compare it to this. And the difference between those is what's going to drive these proficiency modifiers are going to be driven by are going to change the odds pretty significantly. So uh, I'll get one odds level up for zero but less than two, and then two, and then three, and then four for if I had six. Uh, so six differences. So if I was 
if this was a one and this guy was a seven, I'd have six, I would add four to one, right? I would add four column shifts to the, uh, to the combat. So that can be really, really powerful, particularly as over time, the units become degraded. So if, if we end up with uh, three solid attacks on this hex, as we advance and all that sort of good stuff, we could knock this full division out if we got, uh, got lucky. But I'm probably gonna take disruptions as we go because many of the combat results, in fact, give both, uh, it's all blurred, give both sides a, a disruption. Uh, so it's a cumulative effect. So the combat has uh, you know, a number of different layers to it. You've got the air, you've got the proficiencies, and then you've got the combat values. And you can already see the combat values are different for attack and defense. And you may well ask, well, how, does it, how, do, how far does everybody move? It's assumed that everyone's mechanized and everybody moves six movement points every turn. And the only uh, differences are in the types of terrain will impact the type of unit and how it moves. So straight up, you know, armor obviously moving through rough woods will move slower than if it's moving through clear or woods. Uh, streams don't impact anything. Cities don't impact anything. Uh, in some parts of the map, down in the Persian Gulf or up in the Arctic, the uh, infantry units, it's two movement points per clear hex. So you've just got to pay attention to what zone of the maps you're in and things like that. Anyway, so there you go. So we're, we're going to go resolve all these combats and we'll see what happens. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll do that uh, pretty quickly and I'll, maybe I'll pop back and uh, put, add, append this to the video. We'll see. This is already seven minutes long. All right, let's have a quick look at the uh, the rest of the, the combat here. So uh, <clears throat> we're in a, a town here, not a not a major city. So I took a, uh, a disruption, and I've got a retreat, and we'll do that in a second. I took an absolute beating here because this uh, full that stays there actually. This full uh, stack of units, he now has six disruptions because he was attacked here and he had to uh, retreat. Oh, sorry, he was attacked here. And these guys are all gonna have to be attacked by the, their own airstrike. So that's interesting, we'll do that in a second. Uh, he was here, he's gonna retreat two hexes, so he had to retreat through a, a zone of control uh, and he picked up an extra loss. Uh, the guys rolled really well there and, and put four uh, put four hits on him, he already had one, so that made it five, then one more for the zone of control, that's six, and these guys only have five. So they took an absolute ass whipping, and they're gonna be out of action for a couple of, uh, a couple of phases now. We're not gonna to wanna to try and uh, fight with them necessarily. Okay, so down here, uh, where you can't see where I'm pointing, uh, this attack here, uh, we forced a, where are we? Right, we forced a retreat. Where did he go? Where's my guy? Maybe it was just a straight up retreat. Yeah, it was a retreat. So he retreated two hexes from here. One, two, and, uh, oh no, okay. You know what? I think I made a mistake. No, that's right. It was a, a one and a half to one attack and uh, they did not advance. They they took a, a, a whip in there and have uh, just picked up, well, they only picked up one disruption each, but nevertheless. Uh, these guys held strong. Uh, this unit was forced to retreat, and we did so. We went one, two. You retreat two hexes for every retreat. And that was all that happened here. Here, uh, down on the, heading towards Bavaria, uh, these guys were had this ground strike on top of them. They'd had one disruption already. They forced, uh, held tough there, and uh, these guys all took a disruption. So it was a DD result, one D for each side. And then further south, there was another retreat here with uh, two disruptions inflicted. And down in Italy, Yugoslavia, Austria area, there was just a bit of a beat down. There was an exchange and an elimination and all sorts of nasty retreating action going on down here. So uh, that's, as you can see, it's a very gradual combat result table uh, because of these accumulated disruptions until the point where uh, the, you know, things just start to get hairy. So next turn, next attack, if 
if these guys could be attacked, we could eliminate two very powerful units, and that would be awesome. Which they can do. They can move from uh, one zone of control to another and, and push in here and try and attack. Uh, that may or may not be wise to do, but they could do that if they wanted to. Oh, and here was interesting. Uh, we picked up uh, a retreat, but because we're in a major city, we can ignore them. So Hamburg uh, hangs tough, and I think these guys are, are going to have to retreat too and pick up that uh, pick up that disruption. So we'll retreat them into Kiel. And these guys advance, and you have to advance at least one unit into the hex. So there you go. So that's the combat result for the for the turn. All right. No, no, it's not for the turn. That's just for one packed activation, one packed segment. There are three segments, and that uh, we also then have the NATO uh, reaction phase and things like that. So uh, lots of activity in a, in a given turn. Uh, each turn is a week. Later.